Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted again by popular demand to be able to speak to Andy Ruff of Schroders, one of the UK's most accomplished investors and Spurs devotee. So welcome, Andy. Well, it's always, it's always nice to be on after a Spurs win. I realize yes. that may be these days. Um, anyway, just sort of big picture-wise, despite the sort of recent wobble on the markets and it being the... 34th anniversary, amazingly enough, of uh, Black Monday when the stock markets crashed 20% in two days back in 1987. What's your view for sort of equities going forward and specifically your sweet spot in sort of small and mid caps? Uh, it's quite interesting. So, yeah, Black Monday, I remember trying to, I remember getting to the tube station to find that uh, uh, the only way in was a bus. And so I'd only just been at Schroeder's for like three months. And uh, while I was used to a bit of volatility, I don't think I was used to that much volatility. I remember just sitting around where people were just had their heads in their hands looking at the screens and just going, my God, you know, and when you look at it, it interestingly, when you look at the long-term chart, there is but a blip. Yes. On the sort of upward motion. So, you know, what do I think for equities? But I think actually, you know, we've kind of reached a bit of an inflection point whereby you're looking at sort of uh, maybe interest rates trickling up. And then so that's going to make sort of the financials uh, look more attractive. And you do think actually you know, people still use the bellwether, the FTSE 100 for the health of the UK stock market. So, you know, I can see the sort of financials pushing on, oil and gas pushing on, you know, the drug companies are okay. And, you know, underneath sort of a bit more resilience. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see the, the 100 sort of tick up now towards 8,000, get it, finally get a change of leading digit after sort of 21 years of residing around 7,000. And, you know, underneath that, you've still got the smaller mid caps which are continuing to deliver pretty good results. I mean, you know, bid activity continues to pace. We've had the big premium for one of our holdings today, Playtech. And, you know, there was ever thus in the small and mid-cap area of the market, I would expect to see ongoing activity. Now, you know, markets just don't keep going up. It's quite interesting, you know, following people on Twitter. You know, when they have sort of three-day down days, they go, well, this market's terrible, isn't it? But they never say yeah, they never say the market's amazing when it's been going up three days, and you just have to accept that. And you know, don't try to have an investment time horizon slightly longer than three days is absolutely the key going forward. So you know what we're looking at, we're looking at the sort of bigger picture. Actually, the financial health of the UK looks all right. Uh, economy looks okay. Yeah, there's pockets of yeah inflation. There's pockets of everything. I mean, I'm still getting over the shock of cycling to work. This morning and uh, seeing a full petrol station with no cars queuing but yeah. uh, obviously that is not newsworthy you know far better to say fuel crisis you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's very difficult isn't it i don't know if you find it paul you know the media loves to build up a crisis where yeah. <laughs> wherever it is it's a disaster you know yeah. but actually as a country uh, human nature we're quite good at sort of coming through these things mm. So you don't you're going to do a sort of like a Michael Fish moment back in 1987 when he said there was definitely not a hurricane coming and then within 24 hours or 48, we had one. And that was the reason why you couldn't get on the tube uh, back in October yeah. uh, the 19th. Well, I, think, I think you've got to look at, you know, if, you've got a if, you, if you had a challenged business model last year, uh, unless you've managed to reinvent yourself, you've probably still got a challenged business model. And, you know, if I, if I take two, if I can trust two media stocks, for example, mm. you know, Pearson, Pearson are still struggling in mm. terms of subscriber numbers to their education products. So they're very slow to move on online because they didn't want to cannibalise what is a very profitable sort of uh, textbook business. Now, you contrast that to reach, you know, the old Daily Mirror, Daily Express, where everyone had written that off, you know, and the shares are up sort of, 400% in a year because actually they made the transition to the digital economy and said, right, okay, this is what we need to do. So, you know, you've got to look at these companies. As much as I'd like to say, yeah, just buy the market, it's going to go up. You know, the stresses and strains within it, it remain as, as tough as ever, actually. Yeah, no, I would agree. And certainly stock picking is going to be um, ultra important. You can't just buy a basket. You've got to buy individual companies, which uh, which will add to them. Now, just sort of if we do get sort of inflation ticking up, which is which is the case, and certainly 
with bond yields are now um, ticking up as well in terms of uh, UK gilts and US uh, treasuries. Um, how is that going to sort of play through on the consumer? Because you've got sort of like a bit of a push and pull here. People are a bit unwilling to pay £300 for a pizza or certainly are in Birmingham <laughs> where I live. But, but equally, the amount of sort of car sales is still going through the roof and the, and the housing market is still very strong. So let's, how do you see sort of top level the consumer sort of health with their savings and then sort of we can go through some of the, the stocks in the consumer space because you've got some really nice sort of blend there of, of, of value growth and uh, and gar yeah i mean the consumer is is i think okay consumer savings look pretty good people aren't getting a great return on their money even if interest rates go up by sort of one percent people aren't going to be rushing to sort of lock money away on the longer term as, as for inflation you know i was always used to think that uh, inflation wasn't a problem because everything that was going up in price was excluded from the Bank of England's uh, inflation calculation. Um, and you are, you are sort of seeing that now, in that uh, people are being uh, are putting prices up. More importantly, wages are going up. That's, that's the thing is, you know, where have all these workers gone? People say, yeah, OK, some have gone back to the EU. I accept that. But a lot of people have just given up and said, you know what? Yeah. Why was I working so hard? You know, I might do two or three days a week from home uh, in, in a part-time job now. So, you know, you get into a circle where wages go up and the stresses and strains have got to come out somewhere. And they, does it come out in a reduction of margins for companies if they can't pass on their prices? I mean, I was, uh, I was at a lunch with the CEO of Marshalls and he said that actually the container to ship the stone from India is more expensive than the stone in the container. Wow. And you just, and you know, again, is that going to, is that going to change? So you've got all these stresses and strains, but that's what companies have to do. You know, they have to sort of innovate. Now, if you're Kraft or Mars, it's quite easy because you, you make a Mars bar, which is about a fifth of the size that you and I remember. Drink out, drink inflation. Yeah, I call it, I still call it a Mars bar, you know. And so companies adapt. Now, they've got to take the consumer with them. And you make a valid point about cars and houses because actually cars is a bit of a shortage developing and the prices have, have spiked. And you know, never in my investment career have I seen uh, car dealers, A, making so much money and B, having an appreciating assets sitting on their forecourt. Yeah, and just on that there. one, just because I did notice you've got uh, Virtu on there, which I think is owned by, uh, which basically own Bristol Street Motors, and they came out with some really unbelievably stellar results last week. And, I, yeah. and also, I, I, I seem to remember you've got a nice sort of inside track in, in not in in that sort of industry anyway. What is what is the sort of like the uh, the lie of the land at the coal place at the moment in the market of the dealers? It seems to be just say used car sales. And, uh, you know, doing very well, and uh, and new car sales, the, 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 the sort of like the order book is as long as your arm. Yeah, I mean, we Virtus held elsewhere here. We hold Pendragon and Lookers, but mm. I think anything in that space. So basically, you know, for these management teams, it's, it's a bit like they've won the Euro Million Lottery, yes. each one. And they suddenly got, it's a bit like having a rights issue without issuing any shares. And so this is completely enabled them to... Uh, refinance their balance sheets and put them in a much stronger position going forward and they're not really rushing out on the acquisition trail which in the past has destroyed a lot of value um, and I think that you know people are going to be it's a very fluid market the car market at the moment because a lot of people uh, in London are having to get rid of their diesels like myself you know the old 10 year old Ford Galaxy tragically gone but you know <laughs> And there's a reluctance for people to rush out and buy electric cars because you know, range anxiety still features yeah. largely with these, yeah. these people. So I think I think we're in a bit of a bubble. I think, you know, I was on a call with uh, Robert Forrester on Friday, even though I don't hold the shares. Uh, and, you know, he felt that there was a, a big element of super profits. But, you know, as long as pricing discipline sort of is maintained. And then we see the house, housing market, you know, the mortgage market is super competitive because of this glut of savings. Yeah. And you know, house, house prices continue to tick up because people say, well, actually, I'm better off getting a mortgage if I can um, and not paying the rent because actually rent is costing me more than the mortgage. So, again, you know, it's, it's a very interesting time in both markets. 
Yeah, and I, I did a, you notice you own a company in there on the market, which is a sort of like a property portal, and they came out with half year results last week and frankly blew the you know the blew the book the cover off the ball in terms of uh, sort of like like for like sales. I think it was up sort of like um, twenty odd twenty mid twenties percent and increasing advertising um, or revenue per advertiser as well, and they're seeing extremely strong demand. In fact, actually, they're significantly undervalued compared to. Uh, people like right move how do you see those guys position well you know on, on the market it's been a sort of work in progress for, for quite a while actually yeah so it, seemed a great, it seemed a great idea yeah sign up all the agents um they, they come off right move and the agents effectively will have their own cooperative i mean what could go wrong really yeah. and um but uh, yeah, probably underestimating the strength of the incumbent is a uh, a classic mistake I've made many times, actually. And um, the, the new management there, Jason, who's come yes. in, very much more of a tech focus mm. now. Because you know, why does it take so long to buy a house? You know, surely you could just, well, once you have the survey, everything should be done electronically. You press the button and the whole, you know, we talk about the blockchain. Why can't we, why can't we translate that into the housing chain? Yeah, mm. so everything's digitally done. And uh, he's popping in for a cup of tea, actually, um, on uh, a few weeks' time, Jason, just to talk me through his strategy. Because you know, if you can get enough people at the agent saying, yeah, we're going to use you, then they could be a real contender. Now, it's the question is the number of leads. So between now and then, I'll be talking to estate agents to find out who they're using, where they're getting the most leads, and where they see the value. Yeah. Well, it definitely seems to be a strong underlying demand anyway in the uh, in the housing market. Another one where you've perhaps gone, the, it's gone slightly the other way, where you may have shanked a few sort of golf uh, swings on this one, was a parsley box, which is, I think, an online delivery service for sort of like baby boomers, sort of like uh, sort of ambient and chilled produce and stuff like that. It's a service that I would certainly use, but uh, obviously it's got pretty big competitors like Uber Eats and uh, Deliveroo and people like that, so... It's not a simple well, market. Well, please, please sign up because they need all the help they can get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's a classic case, isn't it? You know, this is for people my age who can't cook. And um, it's sort of, it's a, it's a modern day version of Meals on Wheels. Yes, that's right. We, we, should, we should have a real sweet spot. But again, it's not a question of demand that's hit them. It's a question of actual sort of, you know, pricing increases of the ingredients, and getting getting the staff and the number of people in the warehouse. So, you know, we talk about sort of inflation and the impacts on it. This, you know, it's, it's only a small position for us, but it's still a pain because you know now we're going to have full engagement with the company. How do we get out of this? Um, and we'll wait and see. But it, yeah, we've been here before with these sort of online companies. They hit, hit a hiccup, and some you're in and you haven't sold like parsley box. Others. You're in, you've seen a big premium and you sold them like Victoria Plumbing and then they've gone wrong. So, you know, it's always good to, to remember that uh, stocks can go down as well as up. Oh, yeah. No, there's plenty of my portfolio which go down. So uh, <laughs> I think you've got a much stronger or better hit rate than I have. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then sort of like just on the consumer sort of finishing it off in terms of sort of this coming Christmas. And now there's been lots of sort of like claims about a Grinch Christmas that uh, the supply chains are going to be sort of like uh, scuppering people's uh, festive spirit and they won't be able to get their presents. But it was a I don't know if you saw it, but there was a really interesting article actually in the FT yesterday reporting that one of the big couriers, Yodel, their, CFO, their CEO, was seeing people actually ordering early. And if you get that, then there's certain retailers, and I know you've got sort of like, you've got N Brown and Quiz and, and Studio Retail and people like that who... Essentially, if you get people ordering and, the, and the more, they sell more product early at full price, the whole retail industry, both online and in physical, should in theory do well because you're spreading the effectively the, the purchases, the, the, the Christmas purchase over a longer period, and so to even that supply chain, and it's at fuller price, importantly, rather than discounting a New Year's sales. Well, it should be. I mean, M Brown Studio have been disappointing because I thought actually. Now they've got the sort of, you know, PPI thing behind them, mm. new management, um, 
trading very strongly, return to light flight growth. But they might trade on P's slightly higher than five or six, but then, you know, what do I know? And um, <laughs> I the, did see that the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, but then, then, uh, yeah, go on. And then you see things like, you know, because they've moved out of catalog selling, it's all online. And effectively, they do operate a sort of, you know, claw on the light model. So mm. you can pay, you can pay later, but you know they charge you interest. But now the interest rate is actually done on a scorecard. So you know the rate you pay will be different to someone else. So the FSA go, that's fine. You know you're treating your customer fairly. But um, you know it's, it, sometimes these t- things take longer. And you know going back to Playtech today, you know, mm. we thought we thought it was a sitting duck two and a half years ago. And, you know, we've had to wait two and a half years. But uh, I think that whole sort of space online, sort of retailing uh, to the masses, you know, strong customer base, uh, differentiated offering, personalised, you know, it's still a growth area. And, you know, it's just that people have, people have got very worried about this whole supply, supply chain thing. Uh, because, you know, but when I go into stores, I mean, there just seems pretty, plenty of kit in there. It's not like, yeah. you know, you, you go in, you think, oh, my God, I must buy the last extra large T-shirt just in case, you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, it's just as a quick sort of anecdotal data point. My, uh, my wife's mum, um, she's already done all her Christmas shopping, so or she's, she's got that all in track. And then, uh, and then I know somebody who works at Waitrose, on the tills there and they've been actually seeing a lot of festive buying early so they've been doing more pallets and click and collect for seasonal foods and product and stuff earlier than they've ever seen before so i i actually think all this um sort of doom and gloom and grinch is probably overdone because i actually think the retailers are going to do really well this christmas whereas every, they're priced to sort of like i mean other than obviously maybe the hook group, which seems to have a, a consistent theme of um, shooting itself in the foot. With you didn't go into the you didn't go into the the hook group, did you? I don't think, Andy. No, I didn't. I didn't go into the hook group. Yeah, no. I, the trouble is, I read I read the prospectus, and I couldn't ascertain whether they actually made any money. I mean, there's, there's yeah. so many so many adjust adjusting items and exceptional items and all those sort of things. You know, but you know, going back to the retailers, one of the key things to look at is what's happening to cable and cable sort of, you know, 138 pushing on. Yes. And that, that's a big factor. You yeah, know, cable keeps going up. The sterling keeps strengthening. We get up to sort of 145, 50. Then the, the margins on these, these companies are achieving will go through the roof. Yeah. One online um, or essentially to challenge a beauty cosmetics brand when you did buy was is wall paint which um, I understand is more of the sort of the affordable younger generation sort of like, and they sell into people like, they've done very well in Tesco's, I think, in some of the other supermarkets, but certainly Tesco. How do you see that one sort of like playing out? Because I've always thought that sort of like these premium brands like L'Oreal and um, sort of like Revlon and people like that are sort of like, uh, I mean, the gross margins on them are just enormous. And then to get somebody coming in the lower level and offering people sort of affordable cosmetics should in theory work but how do you see it the, the shares are sort of like uh still relatively cheap actually yeah no we like wall paint. you know it's wall paint and revolution beauty which we didn't do because mm. you know it was too expensive but the, the margins on this stuff are just phenomenal because mm. you're spending all your money on packaging and advertising uh, you know, a wall paint is just you know just got that sort of bottom end of the market and it's sort of got the Instagrammers now. It's got this sort of influencers. It's, you know, it's a classic for the Towie crowd. Mm. And, you know, the guys who run it are just very entrepreneurial. And, you know, you could argue they're probably a bit slow with their internet strategy. But, uh, no, wall paint, wall paint we like. I've got a lot of time for that. And I think anything in makeup is potentially interesting because of the margins that, uh, that could be made. Yeah. No, I would definitely say... Uh... Have a look at that and also have a look at uh, Revolution Beauty because uh, I know uh, Adam Minto there has knocked the ball out of the park. He only started in 2014. He's, he's going to reach 200 million turnover, hopefully, by the end of the year. So uh, he really but seems to be a... Yeah, but on that one, you see, they floated at 160, which is mm. too expensive. And here we are at 124. You know, mm. the, key, the key with the new issue is 
you've got to get the momentum. Mm. You know, so we always say, you know, with all the people involved, be it the management, the advisors, the brokers, etc. You know, we always say that you know, everyone's got to leave the party with a balloon. So, you know, using the analogy for revolution, the management and the backers have left the party with a balloon. The people yeah. buying the shares haven't got a balloon. So are yeah. they going to turn up to the next party? Discuss. Yeah. yeah. I was actually quickly looking at the, the, the gross margins for this industry. And you've got sort of like L'Oreal on about 75 percent. You've got war paint on about 35 percent. You've got revolution mm. at roughly... 45 percent and then you've got your your big sort of mass cosmetics boys like unilever at the mid 50s and stuff like that so there must be an opportunity i guess for war paint to migrate nearer one you know to migrate up the value chain and increase those gross margins as um, as it scales I, I imagine i think i think you're going to see a lot more entries entrance into this market mm. um you know if you're mike ashley or whatever yeah, why don't you have it? You, you know, you've got a number of brands in that stable you could use. You know, and like I say, the cost of manufacturing the stuff are, are, are de minimis yeah. compared to what you spend on advertising. You know, as you've seen with the likes of Lush and all this sort of stuff, you know, you can actually build a brand relatively quickly. Yeah, if as long as it, yeah, if it's got viral, isn't it? Another, just moving now on to the other sort of like topic du jour, which is the energy complex that everybody's sort of like. Uh, has talked about and, has, and the, the, the media has actually had a field day. I mean, there's been so many energy companies in the UK going bust. In fact, the whole of our sort of like family and my, I say my mum, my, uh, my, my wife's mum and my dad are all now, we're all on Eon now because we've been bombed out of our existing companies and put into those guys. So just on that energy complex, again, you've got a lovely um, sort of like mix of different clients. You've got some oil and gas guys, hydrogen and renewables. So let's just start on the, the oil and gas guys, and I understand you really picked your place as well here with with Kistos, which I understand is sort of like a, an oil, basically a largely a gas producer, or aim to be a gas producer disruptor in, in the in the North Sea. Yeah, the guy came to see me. He's the guy, Andrew. He did Rock Rose before, which got sold, mm. and so and some people are just lucky generals, you know. It's just. <laughs> and, Back up. Uh, and he's a lucky general. He came to see me uh, and he was raising money. And I said, look, I'll do this at 165. And he, and he went, no, it's too cheap. I said, well, if you either want Schroeder's on the shell to register or not, I mean, it's your choice. I've got lots of other things I can go and do. Yeah. And he, he even did hard. And, he, and, then, um, he, he, we bought those shares when the gas price was like 18 euros. It's like mm. 140 euros now. Wow. And, you know, basically he... He produces green gas because you know, the, the, the rigs he's got a sort of solar panel run, et cetera. So it qualifies as green gas. And like I say, he's a lucky general. And you, know, you, you kind of look at it, energy transition has been an interesting area. Mm. You know, in the past, we've traded things like AFC, Infinity, ITM, but actually you need a high energy price for the renewable sector to work. That's what people don't realize. Because then you're for, then you've got the investment, and so actually, as we saw with you know ITM's fundraising last week, 250 million. Mm. The, one of the reasons they could do that was because the oil price was 85 bucks, and the, the gas price was through the roof. Yeah. If they'd been down at 25 bucks, and people are going to say, "Well, why not just stay with oil?" So actually, I think people are going to start looking at renewables a lot more closely now because suddenly there's going to be a lot of money going into this space because actually it can because the returns are going to be uh, going to be higher due to the fact that you know fossil fuel prices have gone up so much yeah and what's your view on sort of like um sort of energy costs going forward i mean there is a theory such that there's, an, there's now um, amazingly a bit of discipline in the oil and gas and energy sector, i.e. with US shale now not sort of like deciding to shoot itself in the foot and pump, pump, pump. And likewise, with OPEC being a bit more you know, reticent to carry on pumping and Russia likewise part of that. Is it is your view that we're, we're looking at sort of like higher energy prices, maybe not ballooning above $100 per barrel? Because because if that's right, then the thesis in terms of long term renewable energy and hydrogen and all this sort of stuff, those prices will stay high as well, because as you rightly point out, they'll track what the existing hydrocarbon energies will be. Well, you know, 
people think but, but once you found a well it goes on forever but it's all you know declines by your fade rates 10 percent a year which means you, you've got to go and either sort of inject it with water to get, keep the production up or you've got to go and drill another well and be successful so actually we're seeing a declining uh plateau yeah of oil production and it's you know it's ironically ironic that the us have said we're not doing any more fracking and by the way saudi do you mind if you pump a load more oil and the saudi, <laughs> you know, if you're the saudis you're sitting there and you're thinking jesus i watched that newcastle display yesterday i mean i think i'm gonna to have to spend a lot more than 200 million trying to rebuild that team yeah and keep keep, keep in the premiership so actually you know what i might just uh, Try and get the oil price up so I can actually afford Harry Kane and a few other players. Yeah. But you kind of you kind of look at it and you say, right, okay. I don't think the oil price comes down anytime soon because there's not a huge. You know, at the end of the day, commodity prices are driven by demand and supply, mm. um, and you kind of think, right, hold on, you know, you've got India and China with energy crisis now. Well, 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 where did that come from? You know, have they been lying to us all yeah. the time about how much stock they've got? Yeah, how much coal they're going to be burning, and so you're going to. I think you're going to see high energy prices, which will encourage a real boom mm. in sort of transitional. And you're starting to see it in the number of sort of you know companies that are now looking to raise equity on the market, be it Pod Point, be it you know some of these other things, yeah. because there is a there is a market now which can grow underneath the high oil price, and it's not going. To, it's going to take a combination of so a low more wind uh, and investment in solar to really sort of narrow the gap on what's happening with uh, how much oil and gas we're actually consuming. Yeah. And what about the sort of the oil and gas service guys? Because, I mean, they're still they haven't really responded. You've had the, the, the oil guys and the um, gas guys, obviously, the share price has responded very well. But the likes of Techmar, Lamperal, and Pressure Tech to a certain extent. I mean, I know they're more sort of, they, they did the hydrogen as well and large cylinders, but they do have a sort of like an oil and gas part in there as well. Yeah, so. I mean, you could, you could add James Fisher to the mix, you know, for, mm. for adding to the disaster scenario that's, uh, in that particular <laughs> area. Uh, and some of them, you know, would need refinancing. But there's a lot of skills gone out of this area. And you know, people forget oil and gas doesn't exactly operate in your back garden. You know, it operates in quite a hostile sort mm. of environment like the North Sea. And so the level of maintenance and health and safety and all this sort of stuff can only go up over time. Uh, and you know, we might well see, you know, Lamprell have managed to reinvent themselves into renewables. The same with James Fisher. You know, they're saying, right, OK, we're going to be using wind farms, data measurement, all this sort of stuff. But they can do it because of the higher oil price it means that they're still getting demand for their base services, which is enabling them to expand into new areas. And it all comes back to this point, doesn't it? You know, actually, I don't mind the higher the oil price goes. You know, if the oil price goes to $100 a barrel, which I think it probably will do, yeah. then that can only encourage investment in these new areas. So, you know, we're going to have to take a bit of short term pain for long term benefit. I agree. And let's move it on to those those areas. I know you've got you, you have a holding in uh, in AFC um, Energy. That's not AFC Wimbledon by any chance. And uh, Infinity, which is um, I mean they do Valadium flow um, batteries, but AFC Energy obviously do the uh, alkaline uh, fuel cell stuff that uh, that produces uh, that converts I think hydrogen into electricity, and they're sort of like really well positioned. And they had a fundraise, didn't they? Actually, I think yeah. the last time we spoke, and they brought um, ABB on board, which is a terrific endorsement of their technology. Yeah, I mean, AFC, we've, we've traded a lot. You know, we've traded you know, refinancing at 3P, sold them at 10, refinancing at 4, sold them at 20. You know, I think the bulletin boards on AFC are sick to death of Schroeder's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been about a nice little income earner for you. Been a huge earner. You know, Invincy hasn't quite worked out yet. Got yeah. You know, COVID delays, when you're a sort of startup, you can't really afford that, but they just signed off the Oxford hub. You know, Valadium, from what, with my, you know, CO level physics, even I can understand that uh, if you've got no degradation in the electricity you yeah. put in, then that's not a bad place to be. Yeah, um, they do the large scale off grid, don't they? Batteries for sort of like, yeah. yeah. So you can see that sort of thing, and Gamesa have tied up with them. 
Mm. So look, is it the Paul Say anything, isn't he? If you go back to 99, 2000, when the internet came along, everyone goes, oh my God, everything's going to work. And then nothing worked. And everyone went, it's never going to work, right? Yeah. And then I felt a bit like that. We're in that renewable space. The advantage this time is you've got a benchmark like the oil and gas price going up with, with the internet. You didn't really have that. Mm. So I think we're in a better space this time around. And what about specifically the hydrogen sort of like ecosystem? Because... I mean, obviously, with AFC Works is in there as well, but you've got ITM doing that 250 million. You mentioned the fundraise, and then you've got Sarah's Power as well. And the government is putting really encouraging the transition to, you know, to hydrogen. And when you look at the sort of technology, and I say, my, if I put it to my O level physics, it does actually see the, the efficiency of the energy conversion using hydrogen as a transitionary or as a storage of power. Is actually pretty good. So you can understand why the scientists are saying we should be using more hydrogen. The only danger is that it's very flammable, isn't it? It's difficult to store, I guess. But how what's your sort of the top level view of that sort of like approach? Well, when you have people like Jim Radcliffe in the Sunday papers saying, Yeah, we're going to be investing 2.3 billion, which is probably a rounding error for other countries. But you know, you know, he's normally ahead of his time. Yeah. He knows his so, audience. Yeah. Yeah. And then moving on now to the sort of final part, just on sort of get, get some updates on some of the IPOs. And let's just go to um, Sayeta at the moment, because they're obviously in the renewable space. Well, they do axial flux electric motors for sort of two or three wheelers out in India and, uh, and China. Yeah. And likewise, high performance car, probably for your, uh, your replacement um, Galaxy, they'll be doing a nice Bugatti all electric uh, wheel for them. Yeah, my colleague Ian, he, he bought that for his dynamic fund. Yeah, he's um, he, he's got a, a PhD in quantum physics, so he really understands these things. And yeah, you know, that's been that's been a nice nice one for us. The uh, uh, big technologies group with their oh, buddy, yes. with their buddy tag has been very good. Music Magpie hasn't quite worked with that yet, but just on that one, on music on music Magpie, how are you finding the sort of like the the the, the sort of competitive landscape there? Because there has been a few companies on AIM before who tried that a whole area of recycling and refurbishing electrical sort of like disused electrical products like mobile phones and iPads and computers and it becomes quite a sort of cutthroat industry. Well we, we you know Blanco would have been a classic case which had a great market opportunity blew up and then has got his act back together mm. but in that whole sort of recyclable phone sort of business now, you know, potentially it, it's, it's, a, it's a big growth area because actually the functionality on phones isn't changing dramatically, but they do tend to, you know, people do tend to like to upgrade. And Music Magpie, from an ESG point of view and yeah. a profitability point of view, but it hasn't worked out in the short term, should be in a much better space really going forward. Yeah, and with a strong brand. And on the yeah, um, yeah. another one with the IPOs is Lords Trading, which I think is a sort of like a, a nationwide building merchant that serves uh, sort of like all different types, basically from DIY to uh, trade and to uh, you know businesses. Yeah. No, we like Lords. We like Lords. We did that one at Float. You know, management sensible, buy well, understands how the business works. You know, I know it's a bit of a crazy thing to say, but sometimes you meet management who kind of just struck it lucky and can't believe their luck. But this lot have got a real strategy, sort of buy and build, and very solid operation, I think. Yeah, so stick with your winners on there. And then another one which seems to have turned around quite nicely in the Schroeder's portfolio is Equals, which came out with a, um, with a trading update quarter three last, last uh, week, I think it was. And uh, again, they've, they've seen an absolute ballooning of sales. They do B2B um e-payments forex for um small and medium-sized companies but they're also seeing growth now in in their end-to-end -end service solutions business payments for well, it's, larger it's, companies it's quite an interesting space isn't it you know our gentex kind of blow up you've had alpha fx do brilliantly which mm -hmm. is a sort of more of a uh slightly different business and you had equals which has done nothing but the management team under ian stratford has just gone, gone away thought about life and come back all systems firing i mean the only thing really holding the share price back is crystal amber's yeah. stake because yeah. no one no one really knows what's going to happen to crystal amber 
Yeah, I think that once that overhang clears, then um, yeah. you could see a massive uh, sort of re-rating. And I did notice yeah. on the last um, public announcement from, uh, and it's worth people looking at it, public announcement from, from Richard Bernstein at, uh, at Crystal Amber, that he thinks it's a very good op opposition for, or sorry, very good uh, opportunity for somebody to acquire. So uh, <laughs> you didn't you didn't hoist a for sale sign. He's done it now publicly. Yeah, no, he, he does that all the time though. He's, he's oh, does he? Oh, okay. okay. He's done the same with De Rue and everything else he holds. Oh, has he? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. there you go. At least you know. At least I suppose they have to. They have to sort of sell their yeah. um, their holdings or something. And then the last one, which I know is a Chris Mills um, stock as well, because you guys are certainly. Uh, you know, brilliant brains sort of like reached a brilliant opportunities. Like it's, it's tribal, which has come back. It's come, come, you know, done very well. It's SaaS software into universities and education. And of course, with obviously more online, they're doing very well. And then you should see presumably a bounce in their, their testing business once we get back to normality next year. Yeah, I think the whole, you know, it, it's quite hard to play education. Mm. You know, Pearson, Pearson isn't a small company yet. The um, and you know, tribal tribal are quite well placed, but again, you know, they're, they're sort of going through a growing phase where they're probably capitalizing a bit more software than I personally would like. I mean, I'm a big fan that companies write everything off, but um, I think we're probably a year or two away from them reaching a tipping point where the amortization of what they're capitalizing equals what they're capitalizing, so i.e., zero cost of the PL, right? Okay. All right. Well, uh, any others to sort of like for, for investors to put their, 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 their slide wall over? Is Spurs going to list at some point in time? Are you going to sort of like bring them public, uh, owned by um, uh, you know Mr. Bruff Enterprises? Spurs, Spurs won't list. Spurs, Spurs, you know, Spurs won't list. Um, no, I think it's you know what what's interesting. I don't know if anyone had seen the uh, our new idea of sell it to the city. Have you seen that on PI no. World, your competitor? Where we got four four people to pitch their ideas oh, to, right, three okay. fund, to three fund managers. So, if there's anyone watching this who fancies pitching stocks on that, then um, get in touch. And is that three Schroders um, fund managers, or is that a selection? It's me, Judith McKenzie, and I'm Downing, uh, and Downing, and Stephen uh, English from Stonegate. Right. Okay. Well, that sounds fascinating. So, um, yeah, I recommend people to. That's that's the Dragon's Den equivalent in the uh, serious the sort of fund manager industry. That's it. Yeah. Right. yeah. To give, give 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 because you know what? Since I took to Twitter, I'm I'm just really impressed with the amount of knowledge that is out there. Actually, so it's it's having a, an increasing dialogue between institutions and retail. I think is a very interesting development going forward. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, thanks very much, right. Andy, for your time. Look forward to speaking to you uh, in the new year and uh, keep up the great investments. Cheerful. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye.